Hello, welcome back to the channel. We're enthusiasts of British motor vehicles and this time we're at the Gloucestershire Vintage and Country Extravaganza in South Cerny. We'll be looking at some classic cars, some of our club Thank members you. gathered around under the Coleman Shelter, some more classic cars, military vehicles, steam and haulage, tractors and farm equipment too. So there's a lot to get through. So let's get into it right after this message. When your classic car cover is coming up for renewal, try our club scheme arranged with Peter James Insurance. It offers great rates and a range of exclusive benefits including free salvage retention and multi-vehicle options. Just click the link in the description below to get a quote. Classic Range Rover, the prototype uh, heading up the lineup. So it's a rolling chassis and it was designed to demonstrate what the vehicles would be capable of. Then we got a, an early Ford Mondeo on every street and then they've just vanished. <laughs> We've got the uh, marks of uh, the Triumph uh, brand, the Roots Group, also is uh, a Triumph 2000 uh, gone round, followed by the Stag. Uh, Stags come with the straight six or the uh, V8 engine, often confused with the V8 Rover engine. Some similarities, but totally different engine. Ford Mondeo, the replacement for the Sierra. How long have we had this one? Uh, just about six years, eh? Yeah. There is one on site that was sort of modified, chopped up and made into a camper. You don't plan to do that with yours? Uh, no, I think I'll stick with my 986. <laughs> So you're with the enthusiast of British Motor Vehicles. Do you want to tell people what that is and how it's come about? Uh, it started as a um, social media group about 10 years ago, um, and it was basically for any British-built car. Uh, we did originally stipulate built before 85, but we've increased it to 2005 now to increase to have the youngsters get more involved, which is sort of why you see cars like this. They were common as muck, millions of them made, but they're getting a rare sight now. And if you don't say you have a handful of them, they're just going to vanish. You know, they were pretty much everyday cars, unloved. But I've had people say to me this weekend, oh, I've never seen one of them before. I've only ever seen a Mark III, four or five. So you've got to save them before they all rust away. The Mark Ones did vanish very quickly and they were very notorious for having duct tape on the bumpers. So Yeah, well, done. it doesn't. It's, it's the eighth wonder of the world. It has no duct tape on the bumper. <laughs> you must have a secret. <laughs> the later MGs were built for the American market and they went on to have a sort of, they'd done away with the chrome to meet regulations in the States and they had rubber bumpers. How long have you had this one? I honestly can't remember, but it's something like 25, 30 years now. Wow, wow. You don't know how old it was when you got it? Um... No. <laughs> Fair dues. Oh, that. No, no you've, you've looked after it. I mean, most people have a car, you know, a modern runabout. Maybe they change every three or four years. To have a car that long and look after it, you've done extremely well. It was originally bought as an everyday car. Oh, really? Yeah. I worked at Longbridge and I wanted a, I needed a BMC style car. And we got this. <laughs> Absolutely lovely. Give it a pat. You've kept kept it in, in fantastic condition, and may you have like another happy twenty five years ahead with it. <laughs> Fort Granada, Fort Granada Estate. They were in every street, and then they vanished. Do you blame the banger racers? Yes, I'm flipping well do. <laughs> Although they're handy for spares. So you've got the proper seventies look in this. You've got uh, tiger seat covers. Is this film built in Dagenham? Seaweed. No, uh, no it's, a, it's a, a foreign import. Ah, foreign import. Uh, yeah. You've got a roof box. You've got the vinyl roof on it. You're going for the full look. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. CB. CB. Brilliant. Lovely to see it here. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> Triumph 2000 TC. Yeah. It's that top model. You've got the wood trim panelling across the door, top of the doors there. Yeah. Have you always wanted, always sought after one of these? Yeah, my uncle had um, a two and a half litre um, back when I was a kid, and it, it was a car I always loved. Um, and a fellow club member um, had this, 
and then a couple of years ago um, he, he decided he wasn't able to drive a manual anymore and he gave it to me. Very good, very good. Is it full speed with overdrive? Yes, and the overdrive actually works. <laughs> Can't, can't, can't complain of that, can you? <laughs> <laughs> the overdrive sometimes is fitted onto the side of a gear onto the side of the gearbox. Yeah, these ones you've got a wire come up through the um, steering through the gear column. They quite the quite often break where it comes out of there. Um, but yeah, this one's been up a place that the part of the loom and it you know it, it seems to be holding it together well. You're doing a good job of keeping it on the road. Nice to see it here, thank you. We got a, a green triumph stag. T-shirt to go with it. Yeah. Very nice condition. You. you got a it's sort of semi-convertible. What do you call that model? Uh, well, it's, it came standard. They're all the same. You can either get them with the hard top, a removable hard top, which this one has got. Uh, that's in the garage now, ready, ready for the for the winter season. Um, obviously, a soft top under the tonneau cover there. That if it get any rain today, I don't think we will. Use it all year round. Um, as much as possible. As much as, as much as possible. Yeah. Excellent, love this here. Absolutely love the chrome edging on it. A much sought after car. And now we can see the cars pulling away to do a circuit of the field. First Gar with his lovely white Mondeo, followed by Pat in the MGB GT. Next is the rather noisy Bedford Rascal. We didn't know the owner of the Rascal, he wasn't one of our members. But following that is uh, Ian in his fantastic Mark II Ford Granada estate. Next is Mike in his lovely red uh, Big T, the Triumph 2000, kindly donated by Uncle Brian. And last but not least, this gorgeous green Triumph Stag. Incidentally, Mike told us afterwards that had he known he was being filmed, he would have run away to hide. We're glad you didn't, Mike. We love the old Triumph. Next up, something very special, uh, very rare, so I'm going to do a freeze frame to give me a chance to tell you what it is. This is, of course, a Vauxhall Viceroy from the early 1980s. Um, even in the halls of mass automotive manufacturers, there are some cars that are absolute rarities, and this is one. It's claimed there is only three remaining licensed on UK roads, and there were only 228 left in 1995. So this really is something you will rarely see. Essentially it was the British equivalent of the Opel Commodore from the German arm of the massive American General Motors company which also owned Vauxhall and the fact that the Commodore was also available in the UK certainly did not help with sales of the Viceroy. Next up, certainly not a rarity, this lovely green Mark II Escort followed by a Rover P5B. And now I'm going to hand over to my friend Anthony, as Anthony is our resident Austin expert. Four Land Crabs, grossly underrated cars, come around the arena. The first is an Austin 1800 Mark I, which is followed by a top of the range Wolsey 6, fitted with the 2227cc six cylinder E series engine. Behind the Woolsey is an 1800S, which is fitted with the 1798cc twin carburetor MGB engine. And following it up is a Woolsey 1885, four cylinder predecessor to the six. These cars were all manufactured at the Austin factory at Longbridge. Here's a stunning Roots Group car. I think it was a Humber Scepter, but put me right in the comments if that's not the case. And approaching now is a Vauxhall Wyvern, first registered in 1950. Here's a Volvo Amazon Estate, looking spectacular. In two years' time, this 1926 Austin 7 Chummy will be 100 years old. The white car approaching, Mark 
Ford Cortina, or is it a Mark V? It was a Mark V, followed quickly by a Ford Orion. I tried to buy one once back in the 80s, too expensive. Next up, Ford Fiesta Mark I in a lovely orange shade, followed by a similarly orange Ford Capri. Now back to you, Anthony. Developed as a replacement for the Morris Minor, the Wolsey 1500 was one model of a range, which ultimately included the Riley 1.5, and in Australia, the Austin Lancer and Morris Major, which were built locally. Next is this very tidy Humber Scepter from the Roots Group. Beautiful car. Quickly followed by the venerable Morris Minor. Don't we just love them? Austin and Rover had a successful contract to supply the British School of Motoring with the Metro, and many other driving schools also bought them. So many drivers on the road now will have learned in a Metro. Following the Metro is a Mark I Ford Cortina. Judging by the badging, I think this one is the 1500 GT. So many Austin 7s were converted into specials with homemade or proprietary body kits. This delightful 1932 Austin is no exception. Next, the grey is one of my favourite classics, a Mark or Phase 1A standard Vanguard. That one's the Estate, relatively unusual. Followed by a Rover 200, or is it a 400? Let's see, yep, that's the 200. I had a 216 GSI back in the day, loved it. This is a lovely five-door Rover Metro 114 built at the Austin factory at Longbridge, which is followed by another Austin 7 Special, which has been rebodied since leaving Longbridge in 1935. The 1958 Vauxhall Victor 1500, a rare car, belongs to member Mick Taylor. Mick is reducing the size of his fleet and this Vauxhall may well appear in bangers and cash in the near future. However, he's already bought two new cars to replace it. Here come more of our members with Roy's 1969 MGB GT, followed by Giles in his 1976 Triumph Stag. And uh, for someone who doesn't want to be filmed, he's getting in a lot of shots. This is Mike Peak again, waving cheerily in big T. Hi, Mike. This huge 4-litre 1959 Armstrong Sidley looks even larger with the diminutive 803cc Austin A30 from 1959 following behind. And following the A30, a lovely little Triumph Herald in white, one of Michelotti's best designs for the British. Behind that very tidy Morris Minor is a smashing little MG Midget in red, looking great in the sunshine. Following that, the Ford Cortina, the Mark III, I think that one's the GXL with the twin headlights. No doubt someone can tell me if I'm mistaken. Followed by a Mark III Cortina Estate. And now I'll hand over to Graham, who will talk us through the members' cars on our club stand. Saturday's lineup: Graham and Sue's Row 216 Cabriolet, Giles's Stag, MGB GT from Essex, Mike's Vauxhall Victor, Phil's Rover 3.5 Coupe, this lovely O-type Bedford flatbed truck is owned by Chris and is fitted with a Jaguar XK engine. Ian's Granada Estate. Gar's Mark 1 Mondeo. Anthony and Pat's MGB GT. Mike's Rover 2000. And Gus's Jaguar 420. Socialising under the column, there's one or two sore heads here. 
sorry to interrupt the video, but if you're enjoying it, we need your help. All we're asking is for you to take just a second to hit the subscribe button, and also do the same with the like button. Thank you, we do appreciate your support. Now, back to the video. Our neighbours on this field were the Cologne Classic Car Club, and what an excellent and varied selection of classics they brought along. Nice work, guys. Really good to see this dark red Vitesse. Look, it's smashing. Strolling around the classic cars area, into the section where you've got the Daimler and Lanchester Club. Now, I think this was the greatest collection of Daimlers I've ever seen in one place. The little black saloon there is a Lanchester. For those who don't know, um, Lanchester were taken over by Daimler, and so it's part of the family. You can identify a Daimler easily by the fluted grille. You can see there very clearly on that one. Just beautiful cars, very expensive back in their day. They were the favoured um, automobile manufacturer of the royal family until a bit later on. Now this red beauty just there is the 1951 Daimler Drophead Coupe. Just gorgeous. Very similar to the Conquest, which came a little later on, but it's certainly a step up in class. And what about this, the Daimler, commonly known as the Dart, actually officially the SP250. Some say it looks like a fish, but I love it. Try TR register. These are commonly referred to as hairy chested British sports cars. Not sure why, what's different about them, but they're great sports cars anyway. Don't believe I've ever seen one in that pale blue shade before, but it's rather nice. Just take a look at that green TR7. Wouldn't it look fantastic if it was a convertible? A beautiful Citroen DS. The selection of cars is just mind blowing. Graham said it really is a remarkable uh, display of motor vehicles. Where else can you walk past two gorgeous Bentleys, two white Triumph Stags, a Daimler Dart, an MGB, a Rover P6 and so on and so on. It's just a really excellent turnout. Oh, now looking very smart here, a pair of Avengers. I love this first one with the twin headlights, the smart wheels, lovely paint job, and the one next to it, period correct. Very attractive and certainly brings back memories. Look at these two competing for sales back in the day, a little Hillman Imp and a Mini Traveller. You don't see those very often. Of course, another E-Type and a gorgeous Riley. Excuse me, that's the Wolseley. How could I miss the badge? This 1954 MGTF looks splendid for its age. Alongside it is a 1977 Sherpa motor caravan and then a 1990 MG Metro. A row of three Austin Healey Sprites and an MG Midget. Can you spot the MG? Now the black saloon here, just over 68 years old, is this 1956 MG Magnet. 1489cc engine, looking absolutely beautiful. 
This interesting vehicle is based on a 1937 Austin 7 chassis and the observant will notice the Austin 7 wheels. However, the suspension has been modified. The engine is a competition specification unit made by JAP. Apparently the seat also comes from the Austin 7. Created only a year or two ago, the builders used various techniques to age the new metal and the car now looks as if it dates back to the post-World War II period. It is, I gather, great fun to drive. Off-road, of course. Here's a neat little uh, Bedford HA van in its smart telecom livery. Remember those on every street. And look at behind, there's a Volvo uh, 240 GL, probably. And another little Austin. This lovely Austin Maestro van was in pristine condition, as if it had just rolled off the production line. I don't recall any Austin Rover vans in that colour. Certainly my departmental vans were white. It's good to see a survivor in such good condition. And here's a terrific display by the North Wiltshire Morris Minor Owners Club. Great work, guys. I especially admire the cream, or, or is it white, uh, Morris Traveller in, in view now. Beautiful. Not to mention the convertible beside it. How much fun would that be on a summer's day? In 1956, just 477 Austin A35 pickups were built. I don't know if Austin Service actually had any for themselves, but this is what they may have looked like if they had. They also had matching similar vans. Austin Healy was a British sports car maker established in 1952. It was a joint venture between the Austin division of the British Motor Corporation and the Donald Healy Motor Company. This little sports car is a Dello, made in Alfchurch by nut and bolt manufacturer Delsons just five miles south of the Austin factory at Longbridge. Here's another Austin 7 from 1949. Lovely nickname of uh, Frank. I like it. And from the sublime to the ridiculous, uh, next to it is an MG Metro Turbo. Fast little hot hatch replaced in 1990 by the Rover Metro GTI, which was faster. The ADO 17 range, as seen in the ring earlier, were christened uh, by an Australian journalist, Land Crab, due to the way they cornered. Rude. Smashing little Riley Elf here, looking as fresh as the day it left the factory. Absolutely gorgeous. And a lovely little row of minis. Who doesn't love a mini? Or a real mini, as Anthony likes to call them. Even I had one, look. Even though at six foot tall, uh, I was able to steer it without my hands. The knees could do it. The mini was my very first car. I uh, passed my test in it May 1975. The subframe failed its MOT not long afterwards. The Austin Gypsy, built between 1958 and 1968, was a direct competitor to the Land Rover, the latter being cheaper and simpler to build. On formation of British Leyland in 1968, the Austin Gypsy was discontinued. Another lineup of original minis. Uh, most of these are the later model, apart from that lovely pickup at the beginning. Uh, I have to say, I prefer the look of the earliest minis to the later ones. But still, they're all beautifully presented and still on the road, which is what really counts. Various flavours of 1970s and 1980s Fords. These are uh, Cortinas and Escorts for the most part. All very well presented, as you would expect. Excuse me, madam. <laughs> I 
I suspect this green escort is the same one we saw in the ring behind the Vauxhall Viceroy earlier. Still looks good. Ah, this one at the end looks tasty. The red one, it's an RS Turbo. Much sought after and very well kept. This Mitsoka viewed started life as a Nissan Micra and looks remarkably like a Mark II Jaguar after its facelift. It has a one litre engine under the bonnet and a pickup body to the rear. Now let's look at some cars from before the Second World War. Here we have a 1932 Austin 7, an Austin 7 Special from 1932 again that we saw in the arena earlier, a 1922 Standard, a 1939 Morris 8, a lovely 1924 Triumph, 1936 Austin 10, Cambridge, another Austin 7 Special that we saw in the arena earlier, 1936 Austin 10, a 1913 Ford Model T, 1934 Austin 10, followed by another 1934 Austin 10, excuse me madam you're in the way. 1926 Austin 7, 1936 Austin 7, see how the designs changed over 10 years. I believe it's a 1923 Bullnose Morris and a second Bullnose Morris that might even be a little bit older. 1934 Austin 7 and a rather nice 1923 Bentley 3 litre. Next to that is a 1927 Sunbeam 3 litre, a 1936 Humber, a 1935 Morris 8, and a 1927 Type P Swift. Sorry about all the Austins, but I do love them. Matching the colour of the owner's t shirt. Here's a 1960 Triumph Herald Coupe uh, with the twin tone green. This one's a 948cc being one of the earlier Heralds. Looks very original. Well done to the owners for keeping it going. Here's a late 1970s Ford Capri in silver beside a rather lovely looking Rover P4. Next to that a very nice green Ford Anglia. Nestling behind the Herald, I'm pretty sure that's the GT Cortina we saw earlier on. Looks even better close up. Series 2 Land Rover, they just go on and on. Amazing. The Black Saloon seen here is post war, it's a 1946 Austin 10 with an 1125cc engine. Not really to be used as a getaway car somehow, I think, but it really is in just beautiful condition. stunning in this pale blue is this 1968 Daimler Sovereign 420 which of course has the 4.2 litre engine and parked beside it looking great in the twin tone black and silver Daimler Conquest Century this is the twin carb model with 100 brake horsepower quite powerful for its day and beside the Conquest the cream drop head coupe a rare and valuable model as is the uh, Daimler Dart SP250, 
In fact, there's two of them there side by side. Not often you see that. Next, the dark grey saloon is the Daimler DB18. This one's from 1949, a 2.5 litre engine. And finally, excuse me, madam. The DB18, this one in maroon from 1951. Continuing with the Daimlers, this one is another Conquest. This is the earlier model with single carburetor, 85 brake horsepower. Now we're back on the club stand for the enthusiasts of British motor vehicles. And you just saw there one of the cars that we didn't see in the ring, which was Gus Brooks's lovely Jaguar. Beautiful car. Mike's Triumph there. That's beside Pat's MGB GT. Next to that is Gars Mondeo. Oh, and here comes a group club member and man about town, Dean. Is he going to give us a smile or a wave? No, not even a glance. Hi, Paul. Hi, Gus. Hi, guys. Morning, Paul. How are we? Happy New Zealand Day. Uh, thanks, Phil. <laughs> Here you can see the group's stationary engine, recently rebuilt and enhanced by Gus. Uh, it's used to charge up two large batteries, which can then be used at shows for charging phones and whatever else you might need. Brilliant. Now, before we move on to other parts of the show, the military and farm equipment and so on, just a few stills uh, that show uh, the cars again and some of the members enjoying themselves under the Coleman shelter. Oh, there's Andy Perman's VDP. Love that car. My first car was a Jeep. I was once asked if it was a Ford or a Willis. My reply was no, Triang. It was a Christmas present shortly before my fourth birthday. This lineup of army transport is all from the past proud British manufacturers. The first is a Land Rover ambulance. Land Rover now produce soft off-roaders full of electronics, a Remi technician's nightmare, with the Defender being manufactured in Slovakia. Next is the Austin K9 from the 1950s, fitted out as a signals comm centre. The Scammell Pioneer was brought into service in 1932, with the last being retired in the 1980s. They were used as artillery tractors, Remi recovery vehicles, tank transporters and more. Finally in this lineup is the Bedford MK, which was introduced in 1970-71, still, some still being in service, as a three-tonner, and it was later upgraded to a four-tonner. This is a Bedford QLD 4x4 General Service 3 tonner. They were produced for the Army from 1941 until 1945. And finally, one of the last Bedfords produced for General Service in the Army. This Scammell Commander has on board an M578 armoured recovery vehicle which is used to recover and repair M107 and M110 series artillery SPGs. It was made in the USA but used by both the US and the UK armies. Another ageing Scammell Pioneer for such a tough truck, they really look quite fragile. And another look at the M578. Here we have a lineup of vehicles starting with a Jeep, Ford or Willis, I cannot tell, as all the parts had to be interchangeable, followed by a Daimler Scout car, an Austin Champ, and finally a second Champ.
There were several Scammell commanders on the rally field. Only 125 of these were built to replace the Thornycroft Mighty Anta, and all were delivered to the 7th Tank Transporter Regiment. They were in service from 1983 until replaced in the 2000s by Oshkosh M 1070s made in the United States. The load on this commander's trailer is an FV-432 armoured personnel carrier. These were introduced to service in the 1960s. Traction engines were used to move heavy loads on roads to plough ground or to provide power at a chosen location, such as out in a field. The name derives from the Latin tractus, meaning drawn, since the prime function of any traction engine is to draw a load behind it. They are sometimes called road locomotives to distinguish them from railway locomotives that run on rails. Traction engines, as you can see, tend to be large, robust and powerful, but also heavy, slow and difficult to manoeuvre. Nevertheless, they revolutionised agriculture and road haulage at a time when the only alternative prime mover was the draft horse. They became popular in industrialised countries from around 1850, when the first self-propelled portable steam engines for agricultural use were developed. Production continued well into the early part of the 20th century when competition from internal combustion engined power, uh, tractors saw them fall out of favour, although some continued in commercial use in the UK well into the 1950s and even later. This Fowler ploughing engine was modified by fitting a diesel engine on top of the old boiler to provide the motive power and drive the winch drum. It proved successful and its mate was converted a year later. The boiler remaining provides the structure of the machine. Showman's engines, decorated with gold trim and often illuminated with strings of light bulbs under the roof, would tow the amusements to the fair. Once everything was set up, the engine would drive the generator, which in this case is under the green cover, to provide electricity for the ride. This is a Sentinel S4T steam lorry, built in Shrewsbury in 1933. I can remember these steam lorries with tanks on the back spraying tar onto the roads, a tipper lorry spreading chippings onto the hot tar, and then a steam road roller compressing it all together, and the new road surface lasted for another few years. Back in the day, I cannot imagine that traction engines were kept shiny and clean like this one. Even less that the engine driver would give it a polish whilst on duty. 
I just love that this real Mini is actually lower than the top of the rear wheel on the August 1921 Garrett steam engine. Another smart Garrett showman's engine with all its brass and copper work polished. It would appear that this may have been pulling and powering a fairground ride which involved flying airships. You can see the pulley wheel for the belt drive on the front of the generator. Alongside this uh, showman's engine we have a row of uh, trucks, mainly AEC Matadors. The first one being uh, 1952, not sure about the date of the second one. The third one looks like it's been converted into a, a wrecker of some description. The fourth truck is a Douglas from 1952 and the fifth one an AEC from 1938. Finally there's a Unipower from 1941. Douglas and Unipower are related and Douglas still makes airfield moving equipment for moving aircraft around on airfields. The Remy badge on the grill of this Scammell Pioneer confuses me. I was of the opinion that Remy only had army green paint on their vehicles. We can have a good look at the crankshaft to the left and the conrods which connect the crank to the crossheads and then the piston rod which connects the cross heads to the piston which is in the cylinders to the right hand side. On the other side of the traction engine behind the sign, the name sign Betty are the valve gear and its controls. These open and shut the valves as necessary to allow steam into and out of the cylinders. Ian, that is a little larger than a big Ford. I don't recommend touching the wheel. It might go round and chop your fingers off. Ow! Wow, look how fast that Sentinel steam lorry is going across the arena. It's fairly flying.
When one traction engine is not enough to pull the load, put another one in front on the end of a tow bar. That'll do the job. Note, stowed on the roof of this showman's engine is the chimney extension. This will give a better draft, improve efficiency of the boiler and clear the smoke from above the fun seekers at the fair. You will note the chimney on the Sentinel steam lorry is in the front of the cab. Here the driver and fireman sit, the fireman managing the boiler in the middle of the front of the cab. Traction engines were cumbersome and ill-suited for crossing soft or heavy ground, so their agricultural use was usually either on the belt, powering farm machinery by means of a leather belt driven by the flywheel, or in pairs dragging an implement on a cable from one side of a field to another. The commentator is very knowledgeable on his tractors and it's fascinating to listen to him. There was a vast selection of tractors from Fordson, Marshall, Ferguson, Massey Ferguson, Nuffield, Leyland, John Deere and a few more. during the Second World War. That's a Worcestershire tractor, uh, the David Brown uh, master. Their first big success story, about 60,000 of those were made from 1947 up until 1952, and they were a very well specified tractor. If you've heard of a Porsche car, well this is a Porsche tractor, ladies and gentlemen. This is the 111 model, the single cylinder, so a lightweight robot tractor designed predominantly for the European market, and this is the two-cylinder version, and these were available to British buyers in the late 1950s for a period of time. They are cooled as well, so they have no radiator. Nice to see my old mate, Mr. Lee and Robert, uh, in the 1980s, so a lot of the ribbed blocks were uh, refitted, and you can still buy, actually, engines brand new for that tractor. The 6600, driven by Colin Rose, is the direct replacement for the Ford 5000. About 78 horsepower, launched in 1975, and with a quiet cab, because originally cabs were very basic, and they amplified the noise of the engine, so they, they did injure a lot of people's hearing. About 50 miles an hour. Oh, right. Your secret's safe with me. No one's listening. Thank you for bringing it. It's always nice to see something different. Well, the Marshall 115, there weren't many of these made, ladies and gentlemen, and this, was, this basically represented the last great effort from the Marshall Company to make tractors. Less than 100 of these were made, 150 horsepower from the six-cylinder. Production got shifted up to Scunthorpe in uh, the late 1980s, 
and with the Leyland engines not being available, they started to make uh, them with Perkins engines as well. I am absolutely fascinated by the number of people sat in the background just watching their stationary engines and their generally belt driven accessories. Powering pumps, circulating water or generating electricity to illuminate lights, I can understand the fascination and the desire to make them work, but to watch them all day on a rally field, not for me. It seems that loading the group's Wolseley stationary engine onto Chris's Bedford O-Type lorry was a bit of a problem. To be quite honest, Chris would probably have got it done in minutes on his own.